This next section will try to explain what happens when a thermal leaves the ground. This first sequence shows how the valley winds lie in relation to the mountain. As I explained earlier, the valley flow is around a thousand meters thick. If this flow is strong, then you can expect it to strip the warm air from the heat sources on the sides of the mountains. This will be carried in the valley wind until it reaches a more interwind spur. As the warm air is forced to collect, it could also trigger. This will be helped by the wind. The hot rocks above this flow will be free to form thermals that will eventually release on the trigger points above. So as the sun warms the rocks on the south side of the valley, the air there will become buoyant and travel skywards. This flow could be big enough to spin up in as it rises up the side of the hill before it actually releases at the trigger point. Most of the time, it will become more organized and wider as it leaves the terrain. What happens to its structure and the path once it triggers depends on the meteo wind and the lapse rate. This sequence depicts what the thermal will be like if the wind is light, say around zero to 10 kilometers an hour from the south. As I quoted earlier, that these thermals have a tremendous amount of inertia so this light wind will have little or no effect on this column of rising air. As you can see, the clouds form pretty much directly over the trigger points. In this case, the peaks themselves. This is a cross section of this thermal. The weaker lift and sink are on the outside and the stronger core is in the center. Obviously, if there is any wind, then the core will be slightly towards the windward side of the thermal. This will be shown in the next sequence. This next shot, shows the same thermals but with stronger wind, around 20 kilometers an hour. Notice how the clouds are pushed to the north with the stronger meteo winds. If clouds are forming, then it's easier to locate the lift by positioning yourself in an imaginary line between the trigger point and the cloud. That's assuming that the thermal and the wind are not wildly changing with altitude. It's also a better idea to position yourself slightly upwind on the thermal as most of the sink and rotor from the solid thermal will be downwind. If pilots find themselves in a bad area downwind, they could lose a lot of height pushing upwind through a uh, sinking turbulent MS. You can see from this cross section that the stronger core resists the push of the wind. The weaker lift is pushed downwind. Pilots finding weak lift in this area would be wise to search further upwind as they'll normally be rewarded with a much better climb rate. If the thermal is big and doing a good job of blocking the wind, there will also be a good chance that the upwind edge of the climb will be dynamically soarable. This last sequence shows what happens if the wind is from the north. Although the stronger climb will now be on the north side of the climb higher up, lower down the air will be given a nasty twist as the wind rotors over the trigger point. Depending on how sharp the change in direction and the size of the tumble will dictate how much turbulence to expect. How much time the climb needs to organize itself into a smooth steady climb again depends on the following factors. Wind and thermal strength and equally important the amount of turbulence the tumble will produce. The steeper the direction change, the harder the rotor. This cross section shows what the thermal could be like in the tumble zone. It would have very hard edges between the strong twisting lift and heavy sink. If you could see it, it would look something like a twisting French plait, not really for the faint-hearted. The yellow shaded area is where I'd expect to find this kind of activity. If you can avoid flying in this area, it would for sure make your XC flight more relaxed. However, 20 kilometers of wind in the lee on a strong spring day is a little over the limit for most recreational pilots. I would uh, recommend that the trick would be on this kind of day to uh, engineer the flight so you always stay high in the relative calm of the not so twisted climbs or use the climbs coming up the shadier side of the mountain on the strongest time of the day. Failing that, waiting for a day with less north wind would be even better. Okay, so that was the basics of how wind affects thermal development in the mountains. The next part is about lines to take when flying towards or under clouds. 